All right, so today I'm going to talk about uh, Ben Bradley and his chapter uh, from Well-Being and Death, which is called Existence and Time. But let's give you a little bit of background first. Um, for example, uh, the chapters I had you read from uh, Fred Fellman's Confrontation with the Reaper. So, Epicurus famously has this argument that death is no harm to the person who dies. And you can basically summarize his point this way. My death won't be bad for me because I won't be around. Um, that is, uh, as he puts it, uh, how can death be bad for me while I'm alive? Um, because I'm not dead. So dead, while I'm alive, death has not come yet. And then when my death happens, I'm not there. So in other words, there is no time at which me and my death coexist. So this makes death unlike any other kind of harm. Um, any kind of, any normal kind of harm, we would say, is a harm to us because um, we coincide with it. So for example, um, uh, Bradley gives the example of how he stubbed his toe in the summer of 2006. This obviously made a huge impression on him. It was his left pinky toe and he stubbed it really badly. Uh, and this was bad for him because he was around at the same time his toe was hurting like crazy. Uh, so in that sense, uh, his toe stubbing was a harm to him because uh, and his toe stubbing was a harm for him at a time. Uh, so as um, Feldman doesn't go into this so much, but Bradley points out that uh, a key, you could express the key point uh, of Epicurus that um, anything that is bad for someone must be bad for that person at a particular time. Uh, that's like the first premise of Bradley's version of Epicurus's argument. So like the, uh, we can say when the toe stubbing is bad for him. It's the time when he's in pain. Um, and that is a definite, you know, maybe it has vague regions uh, at the end, you know, does it still hurt? Oh, I guess it does, you know. That, but um, certainly it's, it's pretty clear that there is a time at which the toe stubbing harms him. And then uh, Epicurus's second point is, well, uh, if death is going to be a harm, there has to be a, a, a time at which it's a harm, but there's no time at which my death and I coincide, so there's no time at which death can be a harm. All right. Um, Feldman's response... Oh, uh, Feldman focuses more on... Um, the aspect of, uh, he responds to Epicurus's point that death cannot be bad for me because uh, the only kinds of things that can be bad for you are uh, sensory. Are, um, so for example, uh, Epicurus is what's called a hedonist. Um, if you remember at the beginning of the class I had you read uh, uh, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy's entry on well-being, and hedonism is a theory of well-being. That is, it says that uh, there are only the only things that are intrinsically good or bad for uh, us, and by intrinsically that means good or bad in themselves, not because of what they bring you, are pain and pleasure. So pleasure is the only intrinsic good, and pain is the only intrinsic bad. This is the theory of this is the theory of well-being of um, Epicurus. It's also the theory of well-being of uh, Jeremy Bentham, who is the modern father of uh, utilitarianism, which is one of the major moral theories. So it's a very important theory. Now, not everybody is uh, a hedonist. In fact, if Bradley is to believe hedonism is a little bit out of favor. Uh, and he's one of the few sticking up for hedonism these days. But it's a very intuitive idea. We get it. Yes, pain, pleasure, good. Pain, bad. That, that makes sense. Um, but if you are a hedonist, then the puzzle of death's harm is extra bad because uh, 
uh, the only thing that can be bad for you is pain. And, you know, while you might dread your death, there's one thing you can be sure of, you're not going to be in pain because you're not going to exist. Uh, again, we're acting under the assumption um, that when you die, you cease to exist. Uh, Feldman gets into a little bit. He says, well, technically speaking, I have a body theory of personal identity, so I will continue to exist as a corpse. Um, but, you know, certainly if, you, if you're a Lockean or someone like that who says that what, what I am is my consciousness, then the, when I die, my consciousness ceases to exist, so therefore I cease to exist. That makes perfect sense. And Feldman's not going to quibble with that. Uh, he, he, grants, um, he, he grants the termination thesis, as he calls it, that you cease to exist upon death. Um, uh, he said, okay, yeah. Uh, Existing as a corpse isn't a valuable kind of existence, so let's just say you cease to exist. Um, so, but of course, uh, if you don't exist, you can't feel pain. So what's the harm of death? Well, Feldman and a number of other uh, philosophers' response to Epicurus is to say, you are right, Epicurus. There is no intrinsically bad thing that death brings. Um, so the only intrinsic bad if you're, a, if you're a, a hedonist is pain, and sure, we're not going to be in pain after we die because we won't, we won't be around to feel pain, we won't exist. But that doesn't mean that that's the only bad thing that can happen to you because there are also extrinsic harms. And extrinsic harms include the harm of not getting something that you would have gotten. So being deprived of pleasure is itself uh, a harm that a hedonist would have to acknowledge. Because if getting pleasure is a good thing, then not getting pleasure is an absence of a good thing. So it's, it's bad. It, uh, and certainly if you would have got pleasure for something and you don't get it, then in some sense you're worse off than you would have been. And if something causes you to be worse off than you would have been, then that thing it harms you. So that's the idea of the deprivation account. The deprivation account, as specified by Feldman, says my death is bad for me because it deprives me of uh, good stuff that I would have gotten had I continued to exist. Now, of course, you might say, but what if I'm in great pain? Sure, says the deprivation theorist. I don't have to say that death is always bad for you. I just have to say that my death can be good or bad for you. Whereas Epicurus, Epicu Epicurus says my death isn't bad for me, but Epicurus also has to say that my death is not good for you. So th this is a puzzle that can be uh, thrown back at Epicurus. Why do we put animals down? We put animals down when they're in great pain, and we do it uh, out of mercy. We, we don't want them to continue to suffer. Um, so we think we're doing something good for the animal in putting it out of its misery, um, because we're depriving it, in this case, of pain. But, but, says the deprivation theorist, you, Epicurus, would have to say there's no point to that, because uh, if your death is not a harm to you, then it's not a good for you either. If it's not a harm for you, uh, despite it depriving you of things, then it's not a, a good for you if it deprives you of pain. Uh, so deprivation says, um, my death is usually bad but can be good depending on what it deprives you of. If it deprives you of a net amount of pleasure, then it's bad, and it's bad to the extent uh, it deprives you of, of um, pleasure. So, you, in other words, according to the deprivation account, you can rank deaths. So if someone uh, dies peacefully in their sleep at 96, then their death isn't that bad for them, and may even be good for them. If, you know, their existence, like my, my gran lived to age 99, but uh, my dad used to go for lunches with her, and according to him, she would lean across the table and say, I long for oblivion. <laughs> um, she, she was a bit dark sometimes from Gran. I love my Gran, but you know, she could be dark. Um, 
So if that was literally true, then, you know, her death was a good one and in fact should have come sooner um, because she wasn't losing out on anything that she valued. Uh, so that would be, if anything, a good death. And certainly people who seek assisted suicide would say that their death is a good one because their continued existence is nothing but suffering for them. So then their death is good. In contrast, if uh, a teenager is having a great time but then dies in a car accident because uh, they're having too good a time, uh, their death is certainly bad and you can say it's, it's very bad because say they die aged 18 and say that they probably would have lived till in their 80s and they probably would have enjoyed most of their lives, we can say that's a very bad death. Uh, that's a lot worse than somebody who dies in old age. So in other words, you can quantify how bad death is. At this point, um, students usually say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. What do you mean you can quantify how bad death is? They died. Uh, they didn't live. What are you comparing this with? What is this alternative where they live? And this is where uh, philosophers have to admit that they're perfectly okay with this idea of possible worlds. Possible worlds um, is an idea that traces back to the philosopher Leibniz um, and it's a way of making sense of the idea of counterfactuals. So counterfactuals are statements we make that uh, talk about the way things might have been but actually weren't. So they're counter to the actual facts. So for example, uh, people say, if the Germans hadn't invaded Russia in World War II, then they would have won the war. Now, just like all other kinds of statements, we think that counterfactuals must have a truth value. They must be either true or false. But they're obviously different from regular statements. Regular statements like uh, this rag is yellow uh, have a truth, but we know what the truth maker for that statement is. It's the actual rag. What makes the statement uh, this rag is yellow true is the actual rag being actually yellow. That's what makes that statement true. But what is it that makes counterfactuals true? Uh, because they're always saying things that are actually contrary to the way the, the world really is. Um, so I'm talking, if I say, if the Germans hadn't invaded Russia, but they did invade Russia. So, and yet intuitively we want to say that statement could be true. Maybe the Germans, you know, would have screwed up in other ways, but that could be true. Or if I, if I had taken the other route to work today, I wouldn't have got held up uh, by that accident. That seems obviously true. Um, or if it isn't true, that's, it, it's true because it isn't true because there was an accident on the alternate route or something like that. So it seems like there are truth values to statements like that. And they're so useful. We couldn't, we couldn't function without counterfactuals. So uh, we have to find a way of assigning genuine truth values to counterfactuals. And in the 60s, a guy called David Lewis um, suggested a possible world's treatment of uh, counterfactuals. And so possible worlds are actually alternate universes. Nowadays, uh, everybody's perfectly okay with this idea, thanks to Marvel and the Metaverse, um, or DC has a, a similar idea. So the Metaverse is all of these possible uh, alternate universes, and in some of them, you know, uh, Thor's girlfriend finds the hammer instead of him and becomes Thor and things like this. You know, the, there's a whole animated series called What If that, that, that talks about these, these alternate realities. Uh, but philosophers, because philosophers, we're cool, have been talking about this kind of stuff since forever. So uh, when we talk about possible worlds, we don't, think of, we don't mean worlds like planets. We mean alternate universes. Okay, so why am I talking about all this? Well, this is what 
how we work out how bad someone's death is for them. We say, um, what is the nearest possible world, the, the most similar alternate reality, in which the thing that actually killed uh, the person w whose death we want to assess, the thing that actually killed them didn't happen. And then we look at that possible world and we say, well, how long does this person live in this alternate reality? Now, obviously, we can't do that. We don't have a little TV screen that we can tune in to, you know, alternate reality 165. Oh, yes, that's the closest one. And we don't, we don't even know how to measure closest. What do we mean the most similar? Um, there are all these puzzles about it, and David Lewis and uh, a bunch of other philosophers go into, you know, what, what are the correct standards of similarity and things like that. Um, but philosophers think you know, these problems can be solved, and you get the basic idea. So sure, we can't put an exact number on it because we can't actually find the real, real possible world uh, that is the closest one, and we can't actually see exactly how long somebody lives. But the basic intuitive uh, idea that if that kid hadn't died in that car accident, they probably would have lived the average uh, lifespan. I don't know, maybe they had cancer developing, we don't know, but you know, probably. Uh, and that's what, that's what the point of comparison we should use to work out how much of a tragedy it is that they died. So that's the deprivation account. Um, and as we saw in the Feldman readings, you know, uh, you're comparing two lives. To work out how death is bad, you're not comparing you know, the condition someone is when they're alive to the condition they are in when they're dead, because you can't do that, says Feldman. Bradley thinks you can. But Feldman says you can't, you can't do that. Um, uh, what we're doing is we're comparing two lives. The life uh, that they actually lived, which was cut short, uh, versus the life uh, that they would have lived had, it not, had they not that met their particular death. Um, the uh, principle that Bradley uses, um, he calls the difference-making principle uh, relative to time. And this is on page 90. And, uh, you know, it's philosophical jargon, but you can get the basic idea. The overall value of event E for subject S at world W and time T. Okay, so you, some person who dies in a car act, that's event E. The value for that, uh, for um, that person who, who's subject S at world W, let's say that's this, this particular reality, the actual world. According to David Lewis, everybody, actual, is an indexical, which means something that, uh, uh, whose meaning changes depending on who utters it, like the word here or the word me. These are words whose meaning depends on who says them. Actual is like that, and he says uh, all possible worlds are in fact real, so he's perfectly okay with the Marvel idea. It's just that uh, each world is the actual world for that world. So everybody thinks there's only one actual world, which is the universe they happen to be in. But the, uh, for people in other possible worlds, theirs is the actual world. Uh, but they're all real. Um, so let's say W, world W is our world. And time T, let's say the time of death, is the intrinsic value of T for S at W minus the intrinsic value of T for S at the nearest world. Um, so at the nearest uh, world at which E does not occur. And then you can work out um, uh, that that is what a way of computing. It's basically what I said before, a way of computing uh, the value of um, lives. And he draws this little graph. Uh, so for example, suppose somebody dies at this moment. Um, well, then we can say their death is bad for them up to this point. 
past that point, their death suddenly starts to become good for them. Because if you notice, in the, other, in the nearest possible world, the, the dotted line represents the nearest possible world. This is their actual life, and here's where they died. And then, had they continued to live, they would have had uh, positive experiences, positive um, pleasure or whatnot, uh, up to this point, at which point, you know, maybe because of advanced decrepitude or they got sick, they would have had negative. So at this point, their life becomes uh, good for them. I'm sorry, their death becomes good for them. Now, this is what leads to a criticism of uh, Bradley's view on page 92, the Aunt Alice sentence. And the Aunt Alice sentence goes, Aunt Alice's death was good for her during the week after she died, but bad for her during the, the next month. So maybe Aunt Alice was in great pain, which is why she went to get an operation. And so she was, uh, she was down here, but she died. Uh, however, she would have got better and she would have um, risen above there. So in the week after she died, she would have been below this zero line, uh, which is, uh, well, I'll get to that in a second. So she would be below this zero line. So her death was good for her for a week, but then after that it would have got better. Um, this is supposed to be a reductio ad absurdum of Bradley's view. Uh, that is, it says Bradley's view implies the Aunt Alice sentence. The Aunt Alice sentence is absurd and stupid, and any view that implies it must also be absurd and stupid. But uh, Ben Bradley, um, I actually interviewed Ben Bradley for one of my interviews, and uh, I think if you have time, it's worth reading the transcript of that. Or you could even watch the video if you really want to see what he's like. Um, and he's, as I said to him, he's a, he's a big bullet biter. That is, someone who bites the bullet is someone who says, who on hearing supposedly absurd implications of his view, says, yeah, sure. My view says that. What's, what's your problem? Um, and he says that basically about the Aunt Alice view. He says, makes perfect sense to me. Uh, so you just think it sounds weird because you haven't really thought about it. All right, so that's the basic idea of um, the deprivation account. Now, uh, what's different about Feldman and Bradley, because they both have deprivation accounts and their theories seem pretty similar. And in fact, at the beginning of uh, Bradley's book, he says, basically, I've taken a lot of Fred's ideas, because uh, Fred Feldman was Bradley's teacher, I guess, and, uh, you know, refined them and tinkered with them. Uh, although, as he says, Fred thinks some of my views are insane and is not to be blamed for those. But he, he's definitely inspired by Feldman's basic approach. So they both have this deprivation account. Now, uh, one of the puzzles, so, so uh, Epicurus asks this question and thinks you can't answer it because he says the only thing that, the only way in which death could be bad is if it causes you pain, but it doesn't cause you pain, so it can't be bad. But I think this is a, a pretty good response to say, no, 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 you're forgetting Feeling intrinsic bad is not the only way that something can be bad for you. It's uh, possible to miss out on good stuff, and that's how it could be bad for you. But then uh, Epicurus can come back and say, okay, but when am I missing out on good stuff? I'm dead. I don't exist. So, so here's the challenge that um, Epicurus says. Epicurus says, tell me when this supposed harm is supposed to happen. And these are the possible views of when the harm of death happens. Feldman has a view called eternalism, not to be confused with a different view called eternalism, uh, which is uh, where the name is more usually used during a philosophy that comes up in this chapter. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. But uh, eternalism in, this, in the context of this question means your, your death is timelessly bad for you. Uh, and if you read the Feldman, you'll see um, saying, because he says, the sense in which your death is bad for you is the sense in which um, 
this life is big, uh, that you would have lived is bigger than this life that you actually lived. When is this bigger than this? It always is. In the same, it's like asking when is two greater than one? It always is. So that's, that's why he comes to an eternalist view, which is unsatisfactory, and I think Bradley is right about that, and we'll get into that. Uh, the other view is that your death is bad at the moment of death. And that kind of makes sense, like with, uh, you might say, uh, toe stubbing, except, as Bradley points out, well, no, my death is also bad for me. I'm sorry, my toe stubbing is bad for me for the week after when it hurt like hell. I would say my toe stubbing was bad for me then. Um, so con and concurritism, it just makes no sense to me. I mean, if my death is bad for me at the moment of my death, I, I get why you might be led to that view, because the alternatives are, my death is bad for me while I'm alive, which is priorism, prior to the death, or my death is bad for me after, while I'm dead. But this makes no sense, says the Epicurean, because I'm alive. How can my death be bad for me when it hasn't happened? And this makes no sense to me, says the Epicurean, uh, because I don't exist. How can my death be bad for me when I'm, I'm not around? So you might be led to concurrentism or eternalism. Well, you might be led to concurrentism by saying, OK, but what about the exact moment of your death? You're not dead yet, uh, you know, but you know, your death is actually happening to you. So you and your death overlap. But then that happens for what? Literally no time. Because if, if you uh, expand it too much, you could say, well, I'm alive then. Or if you expand it too much, the other say, you say, well, I'm dead then. So it has to be the exact moment, which is literally no, no time long. And if my death happens to me in a, in a moment that is, has no ex, uh, duration, why should I care about that? I would, <laughs> I would never feel it. it. It just seems kind of a crazy view. So Feldman's eternalism view. Um, I've always had a problem with this uh, since reading Feldman for the first time. It just seems to me uh, that if my death is bad eternally, then there's no point in fearing death because nothing changes. It's like normally we think, you know, suppose you're in a plane and the, the engine goes out and you think, oh, shit, I'm going to die. Your fear level goes up uh, because your death is approaching. But according to Feldman, nothing's going to change. Your death was bad. Your death was bad at the dawn of the universe, according to his view. Your death will be bad at the end of the universe, and nothing will change. Nothing changes on your death. Um, Bradley put it this way: there, uh, there is no death that makes its victim worse off at times before she was born than she would have been if the death had not occurred. So yeah, the, the, the view just doesn't seem to make death bad uh, in, in, the, in the way that we want it to be bad. In the way, because um, Bradley wants to say, I, I want to argue that death is bad for you in a way that makes it similar to other things that we say are bad for you, like getting your toes stubbed. Um, Death should be bad like that. If it's bad in a special, weird way, that seems like a cop-out. And to say that death is eternally bad would make it different from all the other bad things. And that seems like a, as he says, like a bad fallback position. So he says, to say that death is ti a timeless evil just doesn't seem to give it the, the oomph that you need it to have. Because, yeah, Epicurus's view does seem kind of crazy. Um, I find, I mean, it, it, it's, he asks some incredibly good questions. But then if you th think about what he's implying, um, you know, I always think of um, that scene in The Shining when Jack Nicholson is chasing poor um, Shelley Duvall up the stairs with the baseball bat. No, she's got the baseball bat. That's right. She's waving it ineffectually uh, to keep him away. And he says, I'm not going to hurt you. I'm just going to bash your brains in. Um, the Epicurean is just saying, you know, you can imagine an Epicurean holding you at gunpoint saying, don't worry, I'm not going to harm you. Uh, 
I'm just going to kill you. You know, and that's an implication of their view because they say death is not a harm. And that just seems wrong because we th say, you know, it's one of, the, one of the worst things that can happen to you. Probably we do agree that it would be worse to be kept alive eternally and tortured. You know, that's why hell is supposed to be so bad. Um, but other than that, death is pretty much up there. You know, it's, it's a capital punishment is, uh, is, at the moment, the worst kind of punishment. There used to be worse kinds of punishment. You could be drawn and quartered and stuff like that. But we've kind of progressed a little bit. Um, so the uh, Epicure Epicurus' view that says that death is not a harm for you does seem an odd implication, which is why people try to answer the Epicurean puzzles. But eternalism just doesn't seem to work. A concurrentism doesn't seem to work. So the, the two main camps then, uh, although, you know, Feldman is obviously, uh, I think, makes a good case for eternalism, it just doesn't seem convincing. So the two main camps are priorism and subsequentism. Now, priorism again, uh, what an Epicurean would say is, well, that's absurd. How can my death be bad for me while I'm alive? So the priorist, uh, first of all, to be a priorist, you have to have a particular, or to make priorism seem plausible, you have to have a particular theory of uh, well-being. Uh, note, remember, Bradley and Epicurus are working with hedonism, that is, the only things that are good for you are pleasure. The only things that are bad for you are pain. An alternate view of well-being that was discussed um, in our earlier readings is desire satisfaction. That is, that what is good for you is having your desires satisfied. Um, now, Bradley has some criticisms of this. If you read the interview that I did with him, he makes this point. If that's what your well-being consists in, is having your desires satisfied, then you should really make sure that you desire that all the truths of mathematics are true. Because then your desires are automatically satisfied. And in fact, um, actually, Epicureans uh, kind of suggested this, that, uh, that you, should, um, you should get rid of desires except desires for simple pleasures. Uh, so Epicu Epicureans, hedonism has kind of a bad name. Uh, if somebody is called a hedonist, uh, it's usually taken as kind of an insult that they just party all the time and they live for pleasure. But the original hedonist, the Epicureans, it was a, it was a movement. It wasn't just Epicurus. It, it was like a, uh, the Greeks went in for movements. Philosophers really meant for something, you know. We had actual philosophers, not people like Jordan Peterson back in those days. And, they, um, and so Epicure the Epicureans tried to inculcate simple pleasures. Like, for God's sake, don't make yourself a wine connoisseur. Because if you make yourself a wine connoisseur, you'll have desires that are incredibly expensive to satisfy. Instead, you, could, you should make your desires incredibly easy. So just make sure that all you like to eat is like dry bread and then it'll be very, your desires will all be satisfied. So um, the desire satisfaction account uh, is not a very, ironically, satisfying theory of well-being. But even if you buy it, um, priorism, well, so, but let's say why why the desire satisfaction theory works well with priorism. Here's, here's the idea. Your death is bad for you, according to priorism, because it means that desires you have while alive will not be satisfied. You know, so, and this is kind of an intuitive idea. You know, suppose I'm writing, I'm finally writing that novel I always intended to write, and it's going to be great. Where if I finish it, it's going to be a bestseller. Like, um, remember a few years ago, there was that craze about the girl with the dragon tattoo, and there's three of them. There's the girl with the dragon, dragon tattoo, the girl who kicks the hornet's nest, and the girl who played with fire. These were all written by uh, this one Swedish guy, and I've forgotten his name. Um, 
who was actually a journalist. And he was a, he was a, a real journalist, who cru a crusading journalist against, um, uh, he was a very left-wing guy, uh, and he reported on neo-Nazism in Sweden and things like this, and got death threats and stuff. And, uh, uh, and he was always asked, well, you know, you, you, you work at these very struggling publications, uh, and he said, uh, you're, you're never going to have any money. And he said, oh, don't worry. I know how to write a bestseller. Um, I'm going to be rich when I finally, when I want to be rich, I'll just sit down and write my bestseller and, I, and it'll be fine. And eventually he got to about the age 50 and he said, okay, I'm going to write it. And he wrote all three of them. And before he submitted any of them for publication, then he submitted them for publication. And before they came out, he was, he was going back to work at the building that his, um, uh, his offices for his uh, journal, uh, for this underground newspaper were, and the elevator was out as it normally was because they had no money, and he climbed all of the stairs and he died of a heart attack. And then all the books come out, and of course they're the, the biggest thing since sliced bread. They were they were huge at the time, and sadly um, he wasn't married to his partner, and there's a law in Sweden that all the money from this should go to his family, and he was kind of estranged from his family, but they got all the money, and his partner didn't get any of the money. It's, it's kind of a mess. But he was right that he could write a bestseller, because he did. He just never saw, to, uh, uh, saw the profit. So we might say, that was a real pisser that he died uh, of a heart attack before, just as he was about to get world famous and get all of this reward from uh, his writing. That seems like it was really bad for him that he died then, because he had these desires to write a bestseller uh, that were frustrated by his death. Um, so, in other words, your death kind of has a retroactive effect on you as a living person. It's the living person who has the desires that is the subject of the harm of death, and the, the harm is having those desires frustrated by not being fulfilled. Again, I don't find this convincing, and, and I think Bradley puts it well. He says, here's the objection to priorism. If yesterday I desired that it not snow today, but it is snowing today, things were not going bad for me yesterday. Priorism seems to suggest that if yesterday I desired that it not snow today and it snows today, priorism seems to say, uh-oh, things are going bad for me yesterday because my desires that I had yesterday are being frustrated because my desire was that it would not snow and it is snowing. Uh, but he says, that, that's not true. They're not, things are not going bad for me yesterday. If anything, they're going badly today. Priorism requires that we either give up this judgment about snow or say that death is different. Um, so priorism, I agree, sounds a bit stupid. So, <laughs> but Bradley's view is subsequentism, which means my death is bad for me while I'm dead. And that seems even more stupid, because at least priorism has somebody who is capable of uh, experiencing harm. Now, Bradley says, uh, why do you have to exist to be the subject of a harm? And this just seems like such a weird question to ask. Um, you know, David Lewis, the guy I mentioned earlier who wrote on counterfactuals, had a good line that his critics, because he's also a realist, as I said, a realist about possible worlds. He says, you know, all the other possible worlds really exist. And he says, when I say this, people just give me an incredulous stare. And as he says, I don't know how to argue with an incredulous stare. <laughs> um, and Bradley gets the incredulous stare quite a lot uh, when he says, what's the problem? I don't see the problem with uh, a non-existent person being the subject of harm. Uh, in other words, say this is Joe. Joe dies here. Uh, here from here to here, Joe's death is bad for him. 
And notice during that time, Joe is dead, which makes sense. Joe's, uh, so there, there is something commonsensical about subsequentism. Your death is bad for you when it happens, um, like toe stubbing. So mission accomplished. Bradley wanted to say that stubbing your toe, uh, that death is a harm like other harms. Well, like what, just as you can say with toe stubbing, my death is bad. My toe stubbing is bad for me while I'm feeling it, while its effects are happening. Uh, so death is bad for me while its effects are happening. Now, I just from the way I said that, it's not really the effects of death that are happening. You might say it's well, except in that the effects of this death are things not happening. So, um, because you're not feeling this pleasure that, that you would have got. Okay, so the advantages of Bradley's view. One, uh, he's make, made the harm of death seem like other harms. It's not this weird harm that is eternal or uh, that happens to me before it happens, where the harm happens to me before the event happens, or, or that only happens to me at an uh, instant that is too small to measure. All of those are weird. So subsequentism has that advantage. The huge disadvantage it has is the problem of the subject, as he puts it, which is how can it be bad for um, somebody who doesn't exist? Now. Uh, he brings this up on page 80, and he discusses, well, why, why do people think this is a problem? Not something you think you would need to discuss. He says, is it because of a general principle about relations that, uh, the problem that I'm saying the relation is bad for holds between Joe and uh, his death or something? Uh, and one of the things being related don't e doesn't exist. Joe doesn't exist at the time I'm saying that they're related. Uh, and he's, uh, he says, well, but we don't believe that general principle about relations. We think that you can state relations perfectly easily when one of the things that you're relating doesn't exist. As he says, uh, you could, I can refer to Socrates. So Simon refers to Socrates. One of those things doesn't exist, uh, Socrates, and yet I'm perfectly able to do it, so I don't see the problem. Um, so let's get into more of these criticisms. Uh, we've already seen Aunt, the Aunt Alice sentence, um, uh, and he says he can answer that. Uh, S Harry Silverstein, who um, has written a lot on death, uh, Silverstein, uh, and I think Silverstein has a priorism view. Silverstein uh, brings up this account. He says, uh, his mother died quite old, like 85. But in his family, let's say, uh, women tended to live till their 90s. Let's say 95. Um, so, Given that his mother died when she was, and she died of a, uh, the effects of a car accident, what she was, maybe she shouldn't have been driving in her uh, late 80s. Although my mom is still driving and she's in her 80s, so, and driving on the left, but of course it's legal where she does it. Um, so, uh, Silverstein's mother's death by the deprivation account is a misfortune to her because she was in relatively good health. Uh, it would, but according to, um, according to Bradley's view, her death stops being a misfortune to her at the point she would have, see, uh, at the point her well-being would drop below zero. And let's say that would, uh, that, let's say Silverstein imagines that that would happen when she would have died of old age anyway. So that's 10 years after her death. He says, um, it would seem to have been appropriate for my sisters and me to plan a family party for some time in, say, July 2005, which is when this would have happened, uh, 
uh, to celebrate the fact that though our mother's death had been an evil for her through the preceding five years, five years, I guess, not ten years, it now no longer was. Um, Bradley says, uh, Bradley's answer to this is a little weak, but it's referring to an example of his that uh, I think is a good example uh, that supports the deprivation account uh, of a harm, and that's of the stolen baseball tickets. And the example is this. I think this actually happened to a friend of his, that uh, somebody wanted to give him baseball tickets as a surprise and left the baseball tickets in his mailbox, but before he found out about the baseball tickets, somebody else stole them. So this is a misfortune. The, the, having the baseball tickets is, stole, uh, is a, stolen is a misfortune to his friend, despite the fact that his friend is never aware of it. So his friend never gets actual pain from them. It's just this is a misfortune of deprivation. Uh, the, the, we can quantify the misfortune to his friend by how much pleasure he would have got from going to this particular baseball game, let's say it was a playoff game, uh, instead of sitting at home and watching it on TV, which is what he ends up doing. Um, now, he says that uh, the uh, ending of the misfortune is uh, the harm of death is like the stolen baseball tickets. When the harm ends, the victim's prospects do not improve, and therefore it's not appropriate to celebrate. So, uh, so in other words, his response to Silverstein is, is that his view doesn't imply that it's appropriate to hold a, a party at the moment when the mother's death ceases to be a harm to her. Another example from Harry Silverstein is Anne the writer, uh, a great and successful writer. Has, uh, she writes books, she's successful, and then she dies. And then her country is taken over by an oppressive regime that hates her work and purges it. So successfully purges her books from the culture that she is forgotten. Silverstein says this, in my view, insofar as it is reasonable to view this unfortunate perch as evil for Anne at all, and of course if he's a priorist he can say this because her desires to be remembered are being thwarted, it is just as reasonable to view it as evil for her if it occurs, say, 50 years after she dies as if it occurs 10 years after her dies. But according to Bradley's view, it's only an evil to her if she could, fee if there is a nearby possible world uh, where she could have been alive when it happened. So suppose she died age, age uh, 60 and she could have lived to 100. Um, it's only an evil for her if it happens in the next 40 years. If the, exactly the same thing happens and the purge of her work happens and she is forgotten, but it happens after she could have, after she would have died anyway, then on um, Bradley's view, it's not a misfortune to her. Um, now, Bradley says, well, the only way you can make sense of that being a harm to her is if you're a priorist. And he says, actually, my, my view, this principle, is agnostic to theories of well-being. So you can combine this principle with a view, uh, with, uh, a view of desire satisfaction. And then my view can make sense of... Um, her de uh, of a priorist view. Uh, it's all a bit slippery. Um, finally, we get Nix, uh, Feldman's Nixon sentence. That is, um, this principle is uh, supposedly making sense of um, the, the locution, the way of speaking. Event E is bad for person S at time T. And uh, so that's what this is supposed to make sense of. It's supposed to stipulate a way to measure the way in which a certain event is bad for a person at a certain time. But it is consistent with an event being bad for a person when they don't exist. And this is Feldman's criticism. Feldman says, Therefore, you, if your 
um, way of making sense of the sentence allows that something can be bad for someone at a time at which they don't exist, then you're perverting the words because anybody who normally uses the phrase event E is bad for person S at time T um, wouldn't allow that. They would say, oh no, surely if they don't exist, then that can't happen. It can't be bad for them. So given that your theory says it can be bad for them at that time, then your theory is somehow perverting the words. And to illustrate this, he says, it's as if we, tr we were trying to make sense of this locution um, to do with kicking. Uh, that is, suppose we want to make sense of this, the phrase uh, person X kicks person Y at time T. Um, that can only be true, we would normally say, if both of the people exist at that time. But an analogous, uh, ver an analogous thing to principle to DMPT uh, applied to that kicking sentence would allow, would, might make the sentence, Nixon kicked JFK at 7 p.m. on January 23, 1979, you remember um, JFK is shot in, what, 1963, 62 or 63, I think it's 63. Um, so, you know, it's been dead for uh, at least 16 years. Um, but you're saying yeah, an analogous principle to your DMPT would allow that to be true. If, um, if uh, Nick, provided that Nixon moved his foot in a certain area and JFK would have been there, so, because the, uh, this principle says something is bad for you if you would have been uh, experiencing good things had you existed. So it is actually bad for a non-existent person if that person would have been experiencing good things. Um, well, he says, well, a similar analysis of kicking would say that Nixon can kick JFK in, in um, 1979 despite JFK being dead for 16 years. That's stupid. So therefore, this principle is stupid. In response, um, Bradley says, the question of whether death is genuinely bad for people cannot be resolved by an appeal to ordinary uses of words. If saying that death harms people after they die is not metaphysically problematic, this revision should not be scary. It's simply taking the ordinary way of talking about harms like toe stubbings, which I am right, if I'm right are bad for us at times after they happen, and applying it to death. Um, I'm not sure I'm convinced. And, and perhaps the, um, the biggest incredulous stare that Bradley gets is by saying that dead people have a, a well-being level of zero. What's wrong with that, you say? Well, the, the, the alternative is to say they, you can't talk of them having a well-being level at all. Uh, and there's also the question of, okay, if dead people who don't exist have a well-being of zero, does that mean beings that never existed? I mean, every time you're born, uh, every time a, a person is conceived, it means that thousands of sperm that could have uh, joined with that egg die. So there are, there are thousands of possible people for each actual person. Are all of those possible people, uh, 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 do they all have a well-being level of zero here? And are they in some sense suffering? Because uh, on a, in a nearby possible world, obviously, that was the sperm that made it to the egg. And if they have a good life there, so are those people that never exist, are they harmed by not being the ones, uh, by, by not existing? Are they being harmed by not existing in the same way that uh, dead people are harmed by their death? It seems like you would have to say that. Um, I get into that discussion with him in the interview if you want to check that out. Um, now, so Stephen Looper, who also writes a lot on death, says this. It is obviously impossible to make any sense of a state of affairs having a certain value whether intrinsic or extrinsic, for a person during some time if that person is dead during that time. People are no longer responsive. They are incapable of valuing 
when dead. Um, so that's an argue that the argument that the well-being level is undefined. In response, uh, Bradley talks about Marsha and Greg. Marsha is born without the capacity to feel pleasure or pain. Greg has that capacity, but just is put in circumstances where he never feels pleasure or pain. And he says, my view would say that both Marsha and Greg have uh, a well-being level of zero. But Looper would have to say that Marsha doesn't have a well-being level of zero. Greg does, because he's responsive. But Marsha has to have an undefined. And he says, I think that's wrong. Um, then he says, OK, maybe a way to avoid this I idea that possible people uh, uh, could, have, could be suffering or could be being harmed is to define responsiveness this way. This is a um, uh, person S is responsive at time T only if there's some world W and some time T such that S has a positive or negative well-being level. No, I think that would still be covered by my example. Because he says, obviously, uh, another criticism is to say, um, we want to say that there's a difference you have to say there's a difference between a dead person and a shoe. What is the difference? Um, because you don't want to say, you, Bradley, don't want to say the, the shoe has a well-being level of zero. So what's the difference? I, Looper, say that it's responsiveness. What do you say? He says, well, maybe I can define it this way. OK, so in the context of when is death bad, we use this term eternalism to say that your death is eternally or in some sense timelessly bad for you. Uh, but the term eternalism comes up elsewhere in the chapter. And this is the more um, common use of the term in philosophy. Uh, and it is contrasted with presentism. And both of these views are views about the nature of time. Uh, this is something I feel unqualified to talk about, partly because my former colleague, now emeritus, Nathan Oaklander, is one of uh, the world's experts on this topic. Um, the ontology of time. Uh, eternalism is the idea, and this is an idea that David Lewis uh, presses, unsurprisingly, given that he believes in the reality of possible worlds, that the past is real in exactly the same way that the present is real. So dinosaurs are real, just not now. Um, it's, so eternalism about time is the view uh, that time is like space. You could say that aliens exist just not here. They exist, you know, off in some other part of the universe. Well, dinosaurs exist, just not here, off in some other part of the space-time continuum, specifically, you know, hundreds of millions of years ago. Presentists say only the present exists, so dinosaurs are not real. Now, presentists uh, argue that you can make tensed statements that can nonetheless be true. So for example, you can say, a presentist would say, you, you can say that dinosaurs were real, um, and that is a statement uh, which I guess you have to analyze something like, there was a present moment during which dinosaurs existed, but the, the, it, it's not this one. Um, now, he gets into a debate that I didn't think was particularly important. Uh, uh, he used to think that um, Epicurus was kind of committed to presentism, and his view uh, uh, made sense only if you were a presentist. Um, because in some sense, you can say, if you're an eternalist, you can say Joe exists right here. You can say, if you're an eternalist, you can say Joe and his death coexist, not at the same time, but in the space-time manifold, as he says. So Joe exists uh, 
n not at this time, but he exists because he, uh, he, he's present in the space-time. Uh, you look at the space-time continuum and it, it contains Joe. So in the simple tenseless sense of exists, Joe does exist. Joe's death and Joe's, um, Joe's death and Joe both exist in the, sa in the same space-time manifold. So they coexist in some sense, so you can have uh, Joe and his death coincide in the space-time manifold. Uh, not in the way we want, though. So that's why I didn't really want to get into that debate. But sometimes eternalists are called four-dimensionalists. Um, that's another way of referring, because obviously the fourth dimension is time. Um, Lewis, I will mention one use that uh, Lewis, um, as an eternalist, you don't have to be an eternalist to have this view, but he, he does. Lewis, uh, I didn't get into David Lewis's view about personal identity. Way back when we were doing personal identity, um, remember there was the puzzle ab about division. How can you make sense of division? Uh, so for example, uh, Parfit's example of my division, if you take both the hemispheres of my brain and you put them in two different people, uh, what happened to me? It seems like if we're committed to the logic of identity, we, you have to say, I cease to exist at that point. And, which, and Parfit says, but that's stupid, because if one hemisphere survived, we'd say I survived. And if this hemisphere survived, if I, 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 you'd say I survived. But if both of them survive, you say I don't survive. Why is double success a failure? And David Lewis has an has a interesting response to this. He says, uh, no, what happened was is that I was always two people because uh, what an individual is is a four-dimensional object, not just a three-dimensional object. So I, I as an entity, um, are this four-dimensional object that has slices. So you can say, this is just a slice of me. It's not all of me that you're seeing right now. You're just seeing uh, a very short slice of me because the whole of me is the four-dimensional object that begins at my conception and ends at my death. That's all of me. Uh, it's a bit like the old joke, you know, people roll into town and see an old guy uh, leaning on a fence and they ask him, have you lived here all your life? And he says, not yet. Um, you know, so the idea is that uh, your whole life is what you are. So then uh, what Lewis suggests is that when you have uh, fission, what happens is you, you always had two people, it's just that they shared, uh, they shared a section. But that's okay, that's just like a freeway, like in Flint, the 23 and the 75, uh, share a stretch of freeway. And you can say, am I on the 75? Yes. Am I on the 23? Yes. Um, and then they divide, and that's okay. Uh, and so what he says is if fission happened, then there always were two. It's just they didn't know it because they shared a stretch of it. Anyway, none of that's relevant to this debate, but I did promise to explain the other use of eternalism and the contrast with presentism. There it is. Uh, I think you get the basic idea of the debate. I'll leave it there.